Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about art education and the visual arts. Maggie Michael teaches art at American University, the Corcoran College of Art and Design, and the Murray School in Northwest Washington. Kenneth Victor Young has over 35 years of experience in exhibit design and installation at the Smithsonian Institution and at private museums throughout the US. Patrick Morelli is a sculptor and architectural designer, best known for the Behold sculpture in Atlanta that is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King. Welcome to all of you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, Maggie, maybe if we could start with you. Uh, what does it mean to teach art to students who may not necessarily be aspiring artists? Well, most students that enroll in an art course have some interest in art, and if they don't, it, they're being required to take the course in order to get their liberal arts degree. Um, I consider each student in my class an artist, and I start to talk to them that way. Um, and once they start to identify themselves as potentially being an artist or having the possibility of that being true, they start to act um, like, like they could be. <laughs> so they act like artists. Well, um, they take their, their class more seriously. Fair enough. And Ken, you've interacted with a number of students in, in, over the course of your career. How do you deal with students who are aspiring to be artists and, and how do you coach them along? Well, it's my belief that uh, interest is the primary beginning for being an artist. I don't believe everybody is an artist. I think you have to work at that. And uh, in the beginning, you need to know the basics and you need to know what to look for. To put it simply, you need to use your eyes. Most people don't see. They look, but they don't see. And one of the things about being an artist is the training itself teaches you how to see. Fair point. Well, Patrick, um, in terms of seeing, your work, one can see very clearly because it's big. You produce these very big pieces of art. Do you agree with Ken in terms of seeing things, or do you see things kind of internally before you want the outside world to see them? Uh, for me, it seems that if I can imagine a piece, I can do it. And if I have difficulty imagining it, I can't do it. It's probably true in every endeavor, whether you're a scientist or whatever you are that you do in life. Uh, there's something about the human brain that likes to imagine and see before, before it does, and that's kind of the starting point. Well, I find your work, Patrick, to be very interesting because it's so big, physically big. Like the Behold piece in Atlanta is a very big piece. Yeah, 10 feet. How did you, what is it made of? Uh, it's made of bronze, uh, about 1,000 pounds of bronze. It's on a granite base, which is 14,000 pounds. And it's a very difficult process, of course. It goes from clay to plaster to wax and then ultimately to bronze. Uh, but the finished product, uh, hopefully, is beautiful and lasts forever. But how did you transport it to Atlanta? Uh, believe it or not, uh, I actually, I had, had done a quarter million dollars of, uh, of fundraising for that project, for this piece look, overlooking Dr. King's tomb. And I had gone to all number of people looking for donations of time and services. I actually went to the Teamsters and said, this piece is being done at Modern Art Foundry in Long Island City. Will you transport it down to Atlanta? And the guy says, uh, are you a union member? And I said, well, I worked in a steel mill. I was a union member there. He said, OK. <laughs> and he transported it down. There was tens of thousands of dollars uh, donated to that project. That's oh. how it got down there. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting story. Maggie, do you, now you're, some of your pieces are different sizes. Yeah, um, I primarily make paintings. And I suppose what's quite different about making paintings and making sculptures, particularly in bronze, is that I have more freedom to um, not be so committed to what I might see in the beginning. So where Patrick was talking about needing to know what he's making ahead of time, and of course also at quite um, material expenses, with painting, although you could argue that painting is its own expense, I have a lot more um, freedom to respond to what I'm doing and to react to the painting as it's being made. Um, so I don't, um, I don't necessarily see a painting ahead of time. I really work in the moment and respond to 
not just what I see, but what it is I'm surrounded by in terms of thinking, um, like films, if I'm watching certain films, or if I hear a certain program on NPR, um, those things start to inform some of the choices I may make. That's an interesting point. Ken, do you, do you kind of change your paintings as you're going as well? Uh, no, I don't change my paintings. Uh, in the beginning, when you're learning, you try to work to find a style, something that is uniquely yours. And in order to do this, you look at art history and you study artists from the past and you try to find something that you like and then you try to find out how it was made. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to work at the Smithsonian. I got to travel a lot, so a lot of the things that I saw in art history, and by the way, I'm still taking art history at, at GW, a graduate course, uh, I've seen in person. People, I'm really fond of Italian artists. My work does not reflect that, but uh, Piero del Francesca and the like. And uh, it's also involved in, for me, science. I started out to be a physicist. And when I got to Washington, there was a thing called the Color School here. And there was always, there was a big movement in, in art uh, where the color became the basis of the form. And uh, I got locked into that with uh, people who were here at this time, like Gene Davis and so forth and so on, and uh, tried to develop my own language in this style. Well, that's interesting. And you all reference that a little bit, where how do you kind of learn from other artists, but then do your own style without copying another artist, but then having your own style? Is that to me? OK. That's to all of you. OK, I'll respond to that. First, you have to figure out how, how, what, what the artist did. How did he do it? How did he come about doing what he did? What were the materials used to achieve this point? And uh, once you do that, you can figure out how it fits to you, meaning your brain and uh, your hands and your kinesthetic senses and what you really see, you know. And uh, it also has to do with the product, art product at the time. You see, when this was coming along, there was a, a, a special paint called Magnum. And magnum was an acrylic paint that dissolved in water. Well, before that, particularly in art school, we were using oil paint. And it wasn't really uh, wasn't a good, good uh, technique for making things bleed. Although there was artists in the past, like Turner, and uh, well, even some of the Impressionists. But then they would fatten up their paint. So it's all a technique. Fair enough. Maggie, did you have a thought or two about that? Well, I think style is a problematic word to use in terms of describing what artists do and what their work is. I think um, style is important, um, but in some ways we have to think of our work as being independent of style and moving more towards creativity, if not innovation. Um, you know, we've all heard there's nothing new under the sun, and that's somewhat true. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of experimentation that happens um, within an artist's lifetime and what he or she does. And I think people might move in and out of different kinds of styles that might be recognizable as parts of particular movements. Um, you know, it might be more fluxus, it might be more postmodern, it might be more abstract expressionist, it might be more medieval. <laughs> you know, there's lots of different ways that we can categorize our work in a stylistic way, but I don't think artists necessarily think that they work in a style. I think they work to make work. That's a fair comment. And Patrick, do you have a thought or two? About yeah, that? Uh, uh, Maggie's absolutely right. Artists, I think, just work straight from their imagination. And they, I think it's the academics that really start to categorize things, and that's both good and bad. It makes it more accessible to the public. By the same token, 
there's always seems to be a movement toward putting an artist in a certain niche, figurative, abstract, and whatever. And that's very limiting to, to an artist, uh, especially on the pragmatic end of it, when reputations are, are shaped by what the academicians say their work is. And Maggie's right, there's nothing new under the sun. There's been abstract and realistic art since the Phoenicians and the Greeks and the caveman and so on. What is new in the world of art now is that uh, electronic media has entered the, the world, uh, lasers and digital and, and forms that were out of, uh, that were, didn't exist uh, before 40, 50 years ago. And I think we're seeing a lot of new, exciting, innovative things being done in those new media. Could you use a laser with with a big piece of sculpture? I use everything. I do every th uh, style you might call of art, every medium except direct carved stone. So I do architectural design, I do bronze, I do uh, uh, G-clays that I design on a computer that have never touched a piece of paper, and yet when they're blown up, they look, they look like very beautiful oil paintings. They will never approximate the Mona Lisa, but they are quite nice, uh, works of fine art. So I, uh, in terms of media, in terms of style, I'm open and I enjoy exploring all of them. And let's say you do explore, and obviously you're all here because you guys not only explore, but explore well. But let's assume we have an intern who's down the hall, who's interested in perhaps learning from you as artists. How would you use them as an intern? How would you, use, would it be possible to use an intern to kind of guide that student along? It's watch and learn, it's a visual medium. And if an intern working with a good master sculptor, sculptress, uh, or a painter, um, but just by standing there watching the techniques that he or she uses, watching the way colors and forms fall in place, it's a very rapid learning technique. And this is what makes art so exciting. It's not limited to st uh, highly structured technical education. If you get someone who is, wants to be a good artist and has great talent, just their observation alone. Look at what Da Vinci did uh, or Michelangelo. I don't think they had an MFA in anything. I have a strange feeling they learned purely by observation. Well, speaking of the MFA, Maggie, you have an MFA and a Master of, Ar a Master of Arts. That's correct. Why do you have both? Well, I, um, as a young artist, I graduated with my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. A very strong program. And By the I, way, this is a shout out to Wisconsin, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do love Milwaukee. <laughs> it's true. Mm. Um, and then I moved to California. And in California, it was a job that was offered to me um, with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. Um, California allowed any person with a bachelor's degree of any kind to teach in the public schools. And so I began substitute teaching. And after I was doing this for some time, the district offered me a job. They said, we like what you're doing. Um, would you consider getting teaching credentials and get a Master um, of Arts in Education? And so, you know, I went through these steps and it was in a really um, intense four years and I have no regrets. I learned so much. Um, I love learning about psychology. I love um, thinking about language acquisition. Um, California has a really interesting and diverse student population, uh, adult population I'm sure as well, <laughs> given their parents. Um, and it wasn't necessarily my end goal though to be an educator. I still considered myself an artist. And I knew that I would like to have an MFA because um, one reason people do get MFAs today is for the connections that they make within their program. So um, for example, at American University where I'm currently teaching in the MFA program, it also happens to be where I received my MFA 10 years ago. Um, they have a very strong visiting artist program and this was a real draw for me. And I knew that if I attended this school, I would be able to interact not just with the professional artist professors on their faculty, but guest artists that were brought in throughout the semester three times usually to critique, give lectures, and guide the young student artists um, with their practice. That's a good point you made, uh, Maggie, about uh, studying psychology in different disciplines. I think what I love most about the arts is they're not, it's not limited to art. It takes in culture and history and mm -hmm. civil rights and human emotions and color and shape and form and they're all integrated into a work of art no matter what you do, painting, sculpture, whatever. And so you're mm -hmm. taking psychology very well, lends itself to uh, your, uh, your work as a, as a painter. Mm -hmm.
Well, let's take the broader issue of the outside world. Let's assume I really cared very, very much about climate change. And let's say I had your abilities, which I don't, for the record. You guys are terrific artists. But let's say I wanted to do a piece of art that somehow communicated my concern about climate change. How would you paint or do something in a way that doesn't hit me over the head with it, but yet still encourages me to think seriously about a topic? Well, there's several ways you can do that. You can, you can be an in, interactive artist like uh, James Smithson. You could build yourself a room and make the climate change and make you inside of that room and react to that. Uh, you, if you had enough money, you could travel to different parts of the world and photograph the climate change and then put them all together. With the advent of computers, you can do these kind of things that uh, you fuzz them together and so forth and so on. Well, that's one way to do it, but I don't know if you can really make people aware of climate change unless they experience it themselves. That's my feeling. Or if I can also add, you t in the earlier part of the program, you spoke about um, being able to see and about the skill as an artist is learning how to see. And so I think if an artist wanted to have their topic or their content be global warming, you know, they could take a lot of different approaches, which would include research. Um, a lot of our artists um, you know, spend not just time making their work, but researching topics, researching information. Um, art history, for sure. Um, but also things that would be um, content driven in terms of their specific topics. So if it were global warming, you know, you would be on websites, you'd be looking at the, um, the EPA, you know, you would be reading studies by other um, scientists, um, you would read Al Gore's book. <laughs> you know, you would have all kinds of information gathered to then share with whoever your viewing audience is. And I think the challenge, Maggie, always is when uh, uh, an artist tackles an issue or a cause, uh, that the art becomes too preachy and it, 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 it is not effective. And uh, I visited the Dr. King Monument yesterday uh, for the first time in Washington, mm -hmm. a magnificent piece. And there's a quote on the wall that Dr. King says that we prevent war not so much by avoiding war, but by learning to love peace. And if we want to preach, for example, or uh, stimulate a, a, a respect for ecology, we might try to create things that are so beautiful in, in the natural order of things that when we see things that are not beautiful, we feel very strongly against it. And so it's, not, it's a very subtle, powerful way of communicating a, a topic or a cause. When I was in India, there was sculptors by Mahatma Gandhi, of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And uh, Gandhi said back in the late 40s that he had the answer to World War II, but nobody would listen. So I'm really talking about a philosophy that one would have and communicate to others. To do art is a uh, community skill. You have to communicate. Like Dizzy Lesby says, you know, you're playing a room and nobody hears you. Are you still playing? Mm -hmm. So you need an audience to capture that. The same is true with people who write books. They, if they don't have anybody to read them, then what is that? Well, who do you think your audience is for your pieces of work? My audience, it varies from, I don't know, specific types. Well, I think people who are looking at my work are looking for a specific thing that comes out of an idea that a whole bunch of artists were trying to develop to make it clear. So they're looking for that. Like you would go and look for a Matisse or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, contrary to what you say, I believe that style is important. And everybody tries to develop their style. And I think that's true even down the way one dresses, the way you look, 
What is your persona? How do people remember you as a person? It's the way you carry yourself. So all that's involved. Mm -hmm. I think um, to add to that, I, I understand what you're saying. And what I was describing about style earlier is not just style in terms of an appearance, but style in terms of a reason. Um, you know, why would you want to paint in a Matissean way? Or why would you want to bring back data with a found object on the table? Um, you know, what is the reason behind the style? And I think that's what's most important. Can we get back to the issue of the audience? Who, who, who do you think uh, is buying your pieces or looking at your pieces? Mm -hmm. um, I happen to know a lot of the collectors of my work, um, which is wonderful. Um, it's especially you know, great when a person that I know and like or love ends up acquiring a piece of mine because um, you know, I like to know where my work is. Um, when my work is in public collections, it's a huge honor. I'm you know, grateful that my work is being taken care of by the Smithsonian and the Corcoran. And you know, it makes you um, just be so grateful for the people that believe enough in your work. Um, so I think the collectors of my work are um, often kind of your normal working Americans. I have a few international collectors, but predominantly American. And you know, they're professionals. They're mostly educated people, people with college degrees, not always. Um, and I would say they're probably middle class or upper, upper middle class. Although sometimes I, I do believe in trades. And so um, on occasion, uh, a friend and I may um, work out a certain kind of thing if somebody can't afford um, to buy the work. I've been trying to trade my work for a Ferrari. But ah. I have not been successful so far, but I keep trying. Try a Jaguar. A Jaguar might work, yes. <laughs> but your work is, is, is big. I mean, how, how can an individual acquire some of your work? Well, uh, believe it or not, it's also available in collector's editions. I'm very, very lucky that I have uh, a lot of people who, like Maggie, believe in my work and so on, and not everything from uh, the estates of Coretta King and Alex Haley and David Wolpert, a Roots producer, to a um, uh, piece, La Bellissima America, uh, uh, that is in the chambers of the Supreme Court. And Justice Alito had invited me down there to see it when next time I was in town. And that letter lay on my desk for a couple of years. And then I finally went to the Supreme Court. And I walk into this imposing building. And I walk into his chambers. And there it is, <laughs> sitting in front. And the secretary called out the, the Supreme Court Justice. And out came the Supreme Court Justice. And I looked at him. <laughs> Not exactly tongue-tied, but I didn't know what to call him. Mr. Sam, Your Highness, I didn't know what it was, but it was obviously quite a thrill. Mr. Justice. The Honorable. <laughs> the Honorable, right. <laughs> well, th this is interesting, because you're into, your art is really affecting, all of your art is affecting a lot of people who are decision makers. And I assume you want that to happen in some way. Yeah, but decision makers in the very broadest definition, not just people, uh, not the Supreme Court justice, but m mothers and fathers who have very, very high regard for their children, people who care about race and ethnicity and the true spirit of what Dr. King just uh, preached and so on. I want my work to reach all of those people and judging by the placement of the big public pieces and the response I get from emails and collectors and so on, it crosses all cultures both genders, all races, all ethnicities. Behold, believe it or not, even though it's a 10-foot piece inspired by the baptism scene in Roots, gets as much uh, inspirational response from uh, Caucasians, uh, Hispanic, uh, Americans, foreign, and so on, as well as the Eagle Rock September 11th Memorial, same thing. And touching on that point about an issue or, or when an artist deals with an issue or a cause, Quite obviously, I'm concerned about the fair representation of ethnicity and race in, in sculpture in American mass media. When I did the Eagle Rock September 11th memorial, I incorporated a figure of an African American holding a lantern toward the former site of the Twin Towers, because this overlooks the Twin Towers. Word got out that why was I doing a black figure for a 9-11 memorial? And it was really quite interesting, the furor it, it, it caused. Uh, uh, on, that, on that issue, and, I, and they said, why a black person? I said, well, why not? Well, does a black 
sculpture only have to be incorporated in a slave memorial or civil rights? Uh, why is it always a Caucasian man riding on a horse with a sword in the park? Uh, when a young black child goes out into the world, I always say, we only know what we see. When the black child goes out into the world and he sees all sculpture is Caucasian or definitely not black, what does he say about himself, no matter what you preach? Now people can walk to that memorial and say to themselves, I am integrated into the mainstream of, of America. Where was this memorial? It's at uh, West Orange, New Jersey, overlooking the former site of the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. It was the first of the major memorials dedicated in, uh, on September, uh, on October 20th, 2002, one year after 9-11. And it's the uh, only one that I know of that includes all 3,000 names of the home and hometowns or foreign countries of the Twin Towers, Pentagon, and four airline flights. It's not now up for National Historic Site status. But that one piece called Rem Remembrance mm -hmm. and Re Rebirth, I had U.S. Senators coming to my studio looking at this piece, and they said, well, this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, without preaching, without getting on a soapbox, I, every day that communicates a very powerful sentiment to the 100,000 people who visit that memorial. They, they, mm -hmm. they just assume African Americans are a very real part of uh, American culture and Do history. Do you know the uh, sculptor that's in the, in the National Gallery? Uh, who's about, uh, they made a movie called Glory after this, this Shaw, Robert Shaw. Yeah, the, beautiful artist and beautiful movie, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you see that's there and, and that shows black faces and that shows how, how this artist developed it. I don't even know who the artist was, but anyway. I think he was white, actually. I'm sure it was white. Yeah. But, uh, when I was teaching museum studies at the Duke Ellington School, I was thinking Washington has a lot of parks, has a lot of sculpture. Do you know what's there? What do you pass by every day and what do you see? And uh, do a Polaroid, we had Polaroids at that time, make a drawing and describe it to me. What is your feeling about seeing this piece of sculpture. We're going to have to leave it right at that. Thank you all very much. Thanks. If you Steve. would like additional information about Maggie Michael, Ken Young, or Patrick Morelli, please visit gfineartdc.com, americanart.si.edu slash collections, or morelliart.com. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.